But first, what's making news? And China's government has reacted strongly to the long-awaited details of the multi-billion dollar AUKUS deal, which were announced on Monday. Alongside his American and British counterparts, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese explained that Australia will be provided with nuclear-powered submarines over the coming decades. The AUKUS agreement we confirm here in San Diego represents the biggest single investment in Australia's defence capability in all of our history, strengthening Australia's national security and stability in our region. The move is widely seen as a response to China's growing military influence in the Pacific. And Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin cautioned against the deal, saying it will motivate an arms race, a claim rejected by AUKUS signatories. These subs are powered, not nuclear armed subs. They're nuclear powered, not nuclear armed. Australia is a proud non nuclear weapon state and is committed to stay that way. For more on this, I'm joined from Taipei by the Australian's North Asia correspondent, Will Glasgow. Well, welcome to China's Night. Thanks for having me, Sam. The Chinese government knew this was coming. Has the announcement shifted the delicate balance between it and the AUKUS nations, as that rhetoric would suggest? Well, as you say, they knew this was coming. It was, you know, it's 18 months after it was first uh, unveiled in September 2021. So I don't think, I think that the impact of AUKUS has already been baked into all three relationships China's relationship with America, the UK and Australia. And in all three of those relationships, they're very tense. There's a lot of difficult sore spots in the relationship. I think AUKUS is just one of those. So I do think AUKUS itself, as it was announced in late 2021, yeah, that's, that's had an impact. But I don't think this week's changing anything. What's the response been in the community in China? Well, I think... You know, we've got to remember with these, with all Australia and China uh, developments, this is much bigger news in Australia than it is in China. I mean, this is, it's not that this is not news in China, but the way this is cast in China on Chinese state media and as much as people talk about it within China is as a part of a much bigger effort by America. This is how it's cast by Chinese propaganda, an American led effort to contain China. And AUKUS is described or cast is just one of a number of things. So over the weekend, just in the days before this was revealed, CCTV did an, an interesting package that I think kind of speaks to this framing. They they had a segment on AUKUS as yeah, a containment measure, but it was sandwiched between two other uh, segments, one on uh, Japan and South Korea's improved relations, which again, according to China's propaganda ministry, was all a US-led effort to contain China. And then on the other side of the AUKUS segment, there was a segment on US arms sales to Taiwan, again, cast as a containment measure. So, you know, it's as, as the Chinese public is told, this is part of something much bigger with the focus very much on the US rather than Australia. So with all of that being said, there are only a handful of subs decades away. Some will be asking why would the world's biggest military be bothered by that? Yeah, it's a good question, right? I mean, and the extent to which they're bothered or not is really hard to read, right? I mean, the foreign ministry made those comments. Well, the foreign ministry doesn't uh, have intimate knowledge of the Chinese military, the PLA's uh, uh, assessments on all of this. Now, I did speak to a former PLA general, Joe Bo, and he told me, you know, he wasn't dismissive of this at all, of eight new nuclear-powered submarines. He said it would have an impact on Beijing's calculus. We're talking now about, you know, in the decades ahead, a, a long way ahead. I mean, th the reason it matters is because submarines is one of the areas that America and the UK have a significant uh, advantage over the PLA. So the PLA, like you said, does have technically the biggest Navy, but it's behind in submarine cap uh, capabilities. This is an area where the US and its allies have a big advantage and could really limit the ability of the PLA to project force. You know, and the and the event most most often talked about is in a Taiwan invasion kind of scenario, a fantastically difficult uh, military adventure anyway. 
which becomes more difficult if there are more submarines that could get in the way of it. While everyone was trading bubs over submarines, China seems to have a more urgent problem on the domestic front. Economic figures for January and February show a mixed recovery after COVID-0 measures were dropped towards the end of 2022. The government has set a GDP target of around 5% for the year ahead, but Premier Li Qiang says the growth target won't be easy to meet. Well, how does this economic uncertainty intersect with the chair thumping over the orchestra still? I mean, each of these countries is heavily dependent on each other, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. Um, they're, they're all, you know, uh, China's a major trading partner to all three, and uh, China uh, would like to invest more in all three countries. Put the AUKUS announcement to one side, the, the bigger consequence for China with the US, with the UK particularly, is that if, as the U, US economy is slowing down, that's, that's slowing down the Chinese economy when it most needs US consumers to buy its goods as it's reopening after COVID. So, you know, there's a lot of cross currents here. It's not all about security. This is just the, the US-China economic relationship having its own difficulties. In another sign, China is taking steps to return to the pre-COVID times. Tourists will be able to visit the mainland again for the first time in over three years. It's a move welcomed by many both inside and outside China. Obviously, many in the diaspora will be thankful for the opportunity to visit family and friends again. Well, is this just another sign the economy needs a boost? It's partly that. Um, I mean, it's also a sign of how cautious China has been about reopening with the world. I mean, you know, China announced that it had reopened uh, late last year, you know, <laughs> well, not quite. I mean, the, the, I think in the finer details of that, we learned, oh, it wasn't open to tourists yet. You've been able to go in as a reunion visa or for certain class of business investors. But yeah, now everyone has the ability to apply for a visa to go into China for tourism. Um, I think you're right. It is a bit about helping the Chinese uh, domestic tourism industry, at, you know, uh, uh, allow international visitors in there. But look, for, for that local industry, this is a tough time because they've actually had a captive market during COVID. Domestic tourism's done pretty well for much of the zero COVID time in China. Now they've got to compete with all the other destinations that Chinese tourists love to visit. Will Glasgow, thanks for joining China tonight. Thanks for having me. When China's political elite met in Beijing last week for the annual two sessions meetings, President Xi made no secret of his desire for the country to be more self-reliant. Plans were unveiled to restructure the Ministry of Science and Technology in order to better allocate resources and really focus on technological innovation. There's a concern the country is being outrun by its competition, especially in areas like artificial intelligence. China Tonight's Angarad Yo explains. Oh, so what happened next? And the old Premier of China was who? Li Keqiang became the Premier of China on March 15, 2013. This is the latest in artificial intelligence technology, ChatGPT, by a research lab out of America called OpenAI. You might have heard of it. Chatbot GTP. Chat GPT. Chat GPT. It's an impressively powerful chatbot that can generate answers to all sorts of questions by... Actually, I'll let it explain. I am designed to understand human language and generate responses like a human. I have been trained on a lot of text data from the internet, like articles, books, and websites, to learn how people communicate and what kind of responses make sense in different situations. I'm not a sentient being and don't have feelings or experiences like a human. 
but I'm here to help answer your questions and provide information to the best of my abilities based on what I've learned from the text data. You can use it to write an essay, a short story, computer code, it tells jokes. It could probably even write this TV story, except then I would be out of a job. Ugh. People can chat with AI models. They can ask all kinds of questions. People somehow find a certain intelligence. It's kind of uh, amazing. Its popularity has kicked off an innovation race amongst businesses and countries alike. It seems everyone wants a piece of the pie. Oh, thank you. AI will become more and more important, right? You can see um, the huge investment in US and in China. Chinese tech company Baidu have done demonstrations for their own version of an AI chatbot called Ernie. And similar products are expected from Alibaba, Tencent and Huawei as well. That's the future, right? Uh, people can see um, the capability of AI technology. Okay? They can see the, the great benefits the great uh, power uh, AI models can bring to the society. And despite the fact that the software isn't available in China, it's gone viral via third-party apps and VPNs. Its popularity was even acknowledged this month at the country's biggest annual political gathering. The two sessions where tech delegates called for more investments to be made so China won't be left behind in the AI race. China has already made artificial intelligence a national priority. Several years ago, the government published a national plan with the intention of supporting the technology in healthcare and manufacturing and set a goal to become the world leader in AI by 2030. The Chinese government actually identified AI as the future frontier. And so they thought if they were able to win in this race, and then they are going to be uh, the most potent uh, superpower. In November last year, they also released an ethics paper to help guide the tech too. But according to some tech experts, China may already be too far behind to catch up. What? Did that laptop just eat? Who's that? AI development in China uh, is going to encounter lots and lots of difficulties. To have a successful AI model, you have to have three conditions. One is the algorithm. Second is the computation capability. Third is the data as the raw source. So among these uh, three uh, aspects, in every aspect, China is uh, not on the frontier. The factor which uh, holds China back most is uh, China's institution. So this uh, totalitarian institution is the dominant factor which uh, prevents China from advancing. Others have fears about how censorship could play out in this space. Public opinions are already being heavily censored in China, right? And politics cannot be discussed. First concern would be exactly the kind of biased information that people receive from ChatGPT or the Chinese version of ChatGPT. And they may consider that kind of information, for example, government propaganda as the truth. But of course, these kinds of ethical questions are not just for the people of China to grapple with. The design of technology is already not neutral and the way people use technology can be politically motivated as well. But we need to be aware of the you know, social bias embedded within the design of technology and try to avoid that when we use it. At the end of the day, chatbot-style messaging apps could just be the beginning. AI is already able to create artworks, draw pictures. It even made this piece of music. Artificial intelligence has the potential to change the way we live forever. Pie! People need to understand AI and then uh, accept AI. But on the other hand, uh, people also need to be aware of the limitation of AI. Right now, 
AI is just at the early stage. There's still a long way to go to reach the ultimate goal of artificial general intelligence. And joining me now is Ang Howard Yeo. Ang Howard, welcome to China Tonight. Thank you. So how did this Baidu's demonstration of their Ernie bot go? Uh, well, they did it yesterday and it did not go well. Um, instead of being a live demonstration, they did a pre-record and this did not give anyone confidence and ended up wiping up to about four billion dollars off their stocks. So as you can see, AI is a big space and it's something that people are really paying attention to. But the AI technology is pretty impressive here. And are we, could we be on the cusp of something huge here? Uh, I think AI has become the huge watchword in technology. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that it's really just regurgitating whatever we feed it. So humans are really in control of where it's going to go, what it's going to do, and how it's going to behave. So we heard in a story that concerns about privacy and censorship, but that's not just an issue for China. No, not at all. One of the areas that AI is becoming really popular is facial recognition, and that's something that's being used in Australia as well. New South Wales police have been using it, and even Bunnings and Kmart. And there's a lot of implications for the security of, for example, biometric data in that space. So it's something we all need to be paying attention to. Right. Thank you so much for the story. Thank you. Now for what's been trending on Chinese social media this week. And it was all about this queen of cinema and the queen of my heart, Michelle Yeoh, who became the first Asian woman to win Best Actress at the Oscars a few days ago. For all the little boys and girls who look like me watching tonight, <laughs> this is a beacon of hope and possibilities. This is proof that dreams dream big and dreams do come true. Over on Weibo, a hashtag celebrating the win was viewed almost a billion times and netizens couldn't stop singing her praises. What a historical moment. The first Asian to be crowned the best leading actress at the Oscars. Her acceptance speech was such a tearjerker. Everything everywhere all at once is so good and Michelle Yeoh is so beautiful. In the press conference after her win, Michelle said hello in Cantonese and did a shout out in Mandarin. Michelle, Michelle, but despite the celebration, not many of the commenters have actually seen the film she won for. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Joining me now is Wenli Ma. Wenli, before we get into that, she didn't just win for herself. There's this feeling that she won for lots of people. Yeah, I think Michelle Yeoh getting on stage and getting that win for uh, an, an Oscar win, I mean, that is hugely significant. The Oscars sometimes are seen a little bit frivolous, you know, sometimes people haven't seen all of the movies, all of these Hollywood weirdos, but it's a massive international event. It's got so much visibility, and I think when you've got millions and millions and hundreds of millions of people around the world seeing this huge achievement, it's enormous. I mean, this is a movie that speaks so directly to the Asian diaspora experience. You know, it is about a woman who kind of has to save the universe, many universes, through uh, jumping through parallel universes. And um, But really at the heart, it's a family story. It is about, you know, a daughter, a second generation immigrant daughter who feels like she can't quite connect with her mother. And I think that is an experience that a lot of um, kids, second generation kids, third generation kids have with their parents in these cultures that, you know, their parents didn't grow up in, but in these cultures they feel they really belong in. As I mentioned, the hashtag about the win had almost a billion views on Weibo. So why can't Chinese moviegoers watch the film? Like many American films, they're not actually released in China. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once never got a Chinese release. I mean, they don't actually publicly say why. There are some plot lines in there with a character who is lesbian and talks about her sexuality a lot. And that kind of thing tends to get cut out of American movies that do get released in China. But it wouldn't actually make any sense if they excised that entire plot line. So um, I think people in China who have seen it have pirated over the years, uh, but it's never actually been released in a cinema. And there have been a lot of films about diaspora in America released in China before, though. There have been some of my favourites, like The Farewell. 
Yeah, The Farewell and Crazy Rich Asians both were released in China, but they actually bombed at the box office there. It didn't really hit with Chinese audiences. You know, Crazy Rich Asians were sort of criticised for having negative stereotypes, and also that was about very, very rich people in Singapore. So it didn't really resonate with Chinese audiences. And The Farewell, which was actually mostly set in China, uh, had mostly Chinese actors as well, except for a couple of American ones, uh, only made something like half a million dollars in China. It made $1.2 million in Australia, and we've got about 1.7% of the population of China. But I think that really goes to show these stories are about diaspora communities. They are about the experiences of people like myself, people like you, in Western cultures, in Western communities. And it hits on a level that I think Chinese audiences don't quite get. They're not seen as Chinese enough. Uh, and, I mean, let's not make, you know, any qualms about it. Everything Everywhere All at Once is an extremely American movie. It is made by Americans, it stars Americans, except for Michelle Yeoh. And uh, for Chinese audiences, you know, maybe that doesn't work for them. But they never got to see it, so on that point, we may not even know. <laughs> I don't think I've ever laughed as hard as when I was watching The Farewell in the cinema. And I also love like Ali Wong's movies. Like there's just been so many great things to come out of this. But my personal opinion is that I didn't really like everything everywhere all at once. But I feel like I'm not allowed to say that because it's so tied in with representation. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, of course you can say that. But it is that thing where you go, there are so few of those movies. If I say this out loud, and personally, I do love the movie. But if you feel like you're sledging one of the very few uh, movies there are out there for sort of like Asian diaspora audiences, you are a great betrayer to the culture. Great, thank you for that. I feel better, but also worse. So thank you, Wenli Ma, for joining me. Thank you. Also trending on socials this week, outrage over hot pot. A popular hot pot restaurant in China has changed its rules to crack down on perceived cheapskates, stating that customers must order a soup base when visiting the eatery. Previously, people looking for a cheap meal could just order a hot water base for free to cook their meats and veggies in. This one is hard to oppose. They've got to make a profit after all. Is it still hot pot if you don't even order a soup base? Personally, I'm on side with the cheapskates. And considering the cost of living crisis, I get it. There's only three episodes left of China Tonight for this season, and I'll be an out of work comedian yet again. So I'm starting to cut back. Tonight for dinner, it's steamed spam and pickled cucumber. It's just as good as real hot pot, which has been a staple across China for years. But now, people around the world are lining up to get their fix. Brendan Wan explains. Mmm, aromas of Chongqing chili, Sichuan pepper, perhaps some notes of star anise. And is that a touch of bay leaf? Yes, it's the season for hot pot, and it's so hot right now. Hot pot, or guo guo, literally translates as fire pot and has become a global phenomenon, exploding in popularity over the past few years. Oh. I'd rather see a million hot pot restaurants than a million McDonald's. How cool is it that we have such a specific regional cultural dish that's so readily available? Meet Matt Jang, head chef of one of Melbourne's busiest hot pot restaurants. So chef, can you explain what is hot pot? Yeah, so as everybody knows, hot pot got a um, soup in there and also we can cook everything in there, like the meat, vegetables, noodles, dumplings, or you can create your own pot. We use these ingredients for cooking the hot pot paste. These uh, are small pieces ones, we call that spicy chili. Galingo, green onions, fennel, cloves, cinnamon, fresh ginger, onion, and garlic. Yeah. While hot pot styles might vary, for this Sichuan style, spices are grounded together and mixed with fat into a paste. That's the fennel paste. So that's all of that crushed yes. up? And crushed up and the coal fat. Oh, cow fat. Yeah. yeah. The paste is then fried and added to a hot stock. This forms a soup base for dipping the raw ingredients. We need to cook the oil to reach the right temperature. Yeah. And then we put the ingredients one by one. I'm so excited. <laughs> The northern styles are a lot more focused on the meat, whereas in the southern regions, you've got 
your spicy ones, you've got your herbal ones, you've got in Teochew, the really famous for a beef hot pot. And then as you keep going into Asia, into Southeast Asia and also beyond, you've got your Thai style, you've got a Viet version, then you've got Korean hot pot too. Everyone's doing it because I think that style of eating is so appealing. It makes sense that it's gone everywhere. And it's been enjoyed by Chinese people for years, with its origins believed to date back to the Mongol Empire, when warriors ate together around a simmering pot over a fire. Legend has it they used their metal helmets on cold winter nights as a pot to boil meat and bones. But not everyone agrees with this version of hot pot history. It's got many thousand year old history in China and they say it is from Chongqing. Beijing, yeah. I think, says that it's from there as well, but I think it's so written into the fabric of the Chinese culinary history that everybody wants a little bit of it. <laughs> In 2018, there was an outrage on social media when a town in Anhui province claimed it was the home of Hot Pot. The rest of the country laughed. And there's another reason why people love Hot Pot. It's a great way to socialize. I think the social experience is more important than food. You know, it's a bit out of my comfort zone, but that's what makes it exciting. We can't share the food together, so that's why. We like that. That's great. I love it. Can't go wrong. Okay, thank you. When you have multi generational families, when you don't really have a lot to say to each other, having this really active style, really engaging style of eating can really fill in gaps of, I guess, conversation. In my family, my sister's husband is from China and his parents don't speak a heap of English and my Mandarin is abysmal at best. This eating hot pot is something that we do enjoy doing together because we all know what to do. And when my Mandarin runs out, we're still eating and enjoying together. But before we dig in, there's one more crucial step, the all important dipping sauce. You can use 30 different types of the condiments yeah. to make your own dipping sauce. Amazing. Whoa, it's like a pick and mix. I'm going to make you one. Uh, the most uh, classic Sichuan sauce. Okay, sure. Uh, some garlic paste, spring onion, granules, yep. oyster sauce, sesame oils. Should we eat? Yeah, let's go let's back to the it. Yeah. Okay, we got beef tripe, beef slices, some pork ribs, and seafood. And it's dip, dip, and eat. Sesame oil has a function to dilute the, the hotness and also the spiciness. Crunchy, crispy, and full of flavors. Yep. And vegetarians aren't forgotten either. The tofu. Oh yes, the tofu. Getting full, getting fuller, even fuller, just a little bit more, and relax. The really key thing is not over-ordering. It's really difficult to do because you see these like these menus and you're just like, oh my god, I want to try all of these things. I gotta admit, growing up, I was pretty indifferent to hot pot. But after today, I totally get it. I am converted to hot pot and I want more. <laughs> 